Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sam Adams Lanham. I am the Community Engagement Librarian here in the Barrington area. Um, so as the Community Engagement Librarian, that means that I get to put on programs for the benefit of and alongside our local nonprofits. Um, I want to share with you a couple moments of a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have the audience muted and ask that you stay muted throughout. We are recording today's presentation and it just comes off much more, much more clearly um, for folks who want to watch the recording later. Um, we also, if possible, if you could keep your screen turned off, um, it just helps with bandwidth for the people who are watching. Um, I will share the link to the recording to everyone who has registered for the program as soon as it was available. And I believe Peggy will be putting it on CFC's website as well. So it will be available there under their education tab. Um, there will be a Q&A period following Andy's presentation. Um, so you can put your questions in the chat and it's fine to put them in the chat as they occur to you. And then I will um, read them to him when, when he is done presenting. I do have chat set up so that you can only chat directly to me. So if you're trying to get it to let you chat to everyone or someone else specific, it won't allow that. And the reason for that is that it gives me a copy of everything that went in the chat transcript. And some I have seen things that I don't think people wanted me to see. So, so you can only chat directly to me. Um, I did get permission from um, CFC and I am grateful. One of the um, other programs that I am putting on today, um, two actually, are candidate forums in le um, along with the League of Women Voters. So we have elections coming up and school board and library board are a couple of those. So I've just put the links to register for those. If you're from the area and you're interested in learning more about the candidates running for the school board and the library board, please register for those and I'll be sending out the Zoom links for those later today. So thank you and thank you Peggy for graciously agreeing to let me put that in there. Um, so today it is my privilege to collaborate with one of our most beloved local institutions, Citizens for Conservation, as they celebrate their 50th anniversary this year. In addition to our presenter, Andy Hay, CFC is represented here by Peggy Simonson. Peggy has been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. She is a former, a former president of CFC and cur currently chair of the Community Education Committee and serves on the board of directors. The video recording of her January presentation on using native plants to improve habitat is available through both the library and CFC's websites. Peggy? Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everybody, and, and, and welcome to Citizens for Conservation's third program this year, offered by the Community Education Committee and the Barrington Area Library. Uh, in addition to the uh, program that, that uh, Sam just mentioned from January, we also have on our website the program uh, that we presented in February on uh, called If You Build It, They Will Come, wonderful photographs from Steve Barton uh, from his backyard. Um, we're really pleased to have you join us this morning, and but I expect you are getting uh, spring fever and maybe ready to start projects in your yard. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to announce before we get started with the program is about our native plant and shrub and tree sale. Uh, this is an annual sale. It's online now and until April 18th for pre-orders. So you can go to citizensforconservation.org and on the home page under announcements, there's a direct link to the plant, plant sale information and ordering. We have a huge selection and, and a, we have not committed to a, a live sale yet. We're waiting to see what goes on with the uh, COVID problems, but you can order online and pick up will be the weekend of May 7th through 9th. When you order, you specify which time you'd like to pick up because we're trying to spread out to make sure that we don't have a crowd at any any time. If you're a member or want to join, you receive a 10% discount on your order. You can do that online. You can actually become a member online too in order to get the discount. So I uh, hope you'll take a look at a huge number of, we've got 
great information, photos of the plants, uh, all the, spec the specifics about how they, you know, what kind of growing conditions they need. Also, if you're a member of CFC, you may ask for a free site visit by our Habitat Corridors team. Uh, they, they visit your yard to help you plan what native plants and trees to plant. Uh, or if you, in, in, particularly if you're a beginner, you get you know, from, from scratch kind of information, but if you've already uh, been doing a lot of uh, development and have developed good habitat on your yard, uh, a site visit can uh, assign you a habitat corridor sign uh, saying this is good habitat. That's our goal with it. Uh, that is also the information about that's also available on the CFC website under native plants and click on habitat corridors. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Hay and his program on stormwater management. Andy was project manager for Tower Lake's award-winning rain gardens, bioswells, and wetland restoration for stormwater management. He received Lake County's Steward of the Year Award in 2020 for his leadership of this big project. Andy is an engineer and former president of Tower Lake's Improvement Association. I know you will get some useful ideas to manage stormwater on your property and, and perhaps even in the broader community. So we're really pleased to have Andy with us today. Andy? Thank you, Peggy. And uh, thanks very much to Peggy and Anna and, and CFC for giving me the opportunity uh, to present to you all today and to Sam for making this look easy and professional, which I know it isn't. So uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, just before the presentation, Peggy and I were reflecting that uh, this presentation was originally scheduled for 12 months ago and had to be uh, cancelled due to COVID restrictions and what a year that's been. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, as we look forward to a brighter future, it's important that we, uh, we make sure we get out with the message of uh, what's, what's possible in both uh, residential areas as, as well as uh, in uh, communities. Um, I want to start with a couple of confessions. Um, for those of you who uh, were present at the last month's uh, presentation, uh, where Dr. Steve Barton uh, presented the, uh, you build, if you build it, they will come. Um, I, I think I should never follow Steve in any presentations. <laughs> I am not a photographer and I apologize in advance that the, most of the photographs you're gonna see are, are amateurish at best. Uh, the other thing I need to confess, which is probably a bit more relevant to, to this presentation is that I'm also not a gardener. Uh, and even though I'm going to be referring extensively to the creation of rain gardens and even referencing the, uh, the native plants that were selected uh, and many of the varieties that we, we chose, uh, that is not my expertise at all. In fact, I, I wouldn't describe myself as anything more than a, a generalist. Um, but as you'll see as we go through the presentation, to, to, to do projects of this scale requires a lot of coordination. And with that, you need to build a team of experts. And we're very lucky in the village of Tower Lakes to have many uh, expert gardeners and very, very qualified and enthusiastic uh, individuals who helped with the project and certainly made up for my, my gaps of knowledge and gaps of information. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, is a, a, a project uh, within the village of Tower Lakes where we uh, entered into a, a program to build a number of rain gardens uh, as well as a wetland restoration, all in the name of environmental best management practices. So for those of you who don't know, uh, where, who are we? Uh, Tower Lakes is a very small village uh, in the northwest suburbs, suburbs of uh, Chicago. Uh, we're situated on Route 59, north of Barrington and just uh, south and, and west of Wakanda. Uh, it's a very uh, wooded area. Uh, small lots, typically about uh, half to two thirds of an acre, uh, lots of trees, lots of relief around uh, the community. And the community itself is centered and focused around the lake, Tower Lakes, uh, which is actually uh, three small lakes or two, one larger lake and two smaller lakes. Uh, you can see it here nestled around the, uh, the, the lake itself. We've got about 450 homes and about uh, 1300 residents. The community was originally developed in the 1920s uh, as a, a holiday uh, community for people wanting to escape the city uh, in the weekends and things. 
Uh, and, and that's relevant because a lot of the infrastructure also dates back to the early days of the community. So we're quite a, an old community, uh, an established community. It was incorporated in 1966. And then just to talk a little bit about the lakes, uh, we have a total of 85 acres of, of lake. Uh, the main lake itself, I think, is 68 lakers, uh, 68 acres. Um, but it's most importantly, it's a very shallow lake. Uh, the average depth is five feet, uh, with the maximum being only around eight or nine feet, depending on, on, on the level of the water. Uh, and that's very relevant to the presentation, because as a shallow lake, you, you become very vulnerable to rapid changes. Uh, and that's what we have to uh, work to avoid uh, and constantly work to stabilize the lake. And the project you're going to hear about really came out of the Lake Committee's activities uh, in an attempt to try to improve the health of the lake and stabilize the lake in combination with the village's concerns around the aging infrastructure. So um, we do have a problem. Not only do we have a shallow lake, as a small community, we also have quite shallow pockets. And you can see here how the uh, community evolved from its origination uh, in 1840 here. Uh, I've got a pointer I'm just gonna show you. This creek that runs through this center here and down to the Fox River is known as Mud Creek. And that was dammed in the 30s to create Tower Lakes. And you can see the picture here from 1960 with a, a, already a, a, an emerging community about a third of the size of what it is today. And then from the 2018 aerial, you can see where we are today with about 450 homes. Uh, we have no commercial tax base, it's all residential. Um, so anything that we do uh, in terms of projects or improvements is entirely dependent on funding from the community or funding from external sources such as grants uh, and volunteerism. And we depend very, very heavily on volunteerism. And we're very blessed to have a great strong uh, support from the community in terms of both funding and, and volunteerism. So let's talk a little bit about the problems that we face as a community so centered around the lake and yet around a very, very shallow lake. Um, and the key one here, and, and these are in no particular order, but one of the perhaps the most important is the problem of eutrophication. And that's a big word. And I'll be the first to say that before this project, I didn't know what that word meant. But eutrophication is the process by which left to their own devices, lakes become swamps, become fens, and eventually become land, especially shallow lakes. And that's because of inbound sediment washing in from Mud Creek, uh, as well as uh, runoff from other sources, such as uh, gardens and lawns from the homes surrounding uh, the lake, as well as leaves uh, falling into the lake and the, uh, the outcome of the weeds and the algae when they die down and form the base. So the constant process of the buildup of sediment eventually makes the lake shallower and shallower and shallower and less and less healthy until eventually it becomes a marshland and a swamp and a fen and land. And that's what we, we fight to, to improve. We do have problems with flooding. The aging infrastructure in the neighborhood tends to uh, be overwhelmed with some of the heavy rains. And I think we all realize that we've had a lot of those recently. Uh, and that flooding can, can uh, cause both domestic and uh, community property damage as well. Um, because we're a shallow lake, we also are very conscious of the oxygen levels, uh, and it's very easy for the dissolved oxygen to drop either through high temperatures. We've also had situations where the lake's frozen solid, uh, and also uh, occasionally algae blooms, all of which can cause uh, serious impact to the health of the lake and cause uh, fish kills. So by attacking and addressing the uh, problems of the sediment in the lake, we can also improve the health of the lake and the health of the fish. And a lot of this is driven by the runoff. Um, the storm drains that we have in the village typically run straight into the lake. So while they may help to reduce the flooding uh, in the village, they don't do anything to remove uh, the pollutants that appear from the roads or the lawns or from the goose poop. Uh, that just washes straight into the lake. So anything we can do to improve the quality of the water going into the lake is a positive. And then overall, especially from the village's point of view, 
anything we can do to reduce the strain on the on the stormwater infrastructure really helps uh, extend its life uh, and reduce our overall costs as well as improving uh, and reducing flood damage to properties. So the problem the problem statements are quite broad um, and it's interesting that just by talking about rain gardens and uh, wetland restoration and bioswale creation we're able to actually tackle quite a large number or it affect quite a large number of these issues uh, and you can see here highlighted in red uh, the impact of, of these projects uh, has had it doesn't it doesn't fix everything not by a long way and we have other uh, projects ongoing such as sediment removal um, as well as a, an ongoing uh, lake management program to measure the oxygen levels but it's quite surprising, at least to me, how broad the reach can be of a, a rain garden project. So when we look at the uh, solutions that we, we've uh, approached, you know, I, I just mentioned sediment removal. That's expensive, time consuming, but we have been on a, a 10 year journey to reduce the sediment in the lake mechanically by uh, uh, harvesting it through vacuum pumps uh, out and into bags, which then go out, out onto the lands. We also uh, manage the weeds. We uh, have an active uh, goose control program in place with Illinois DNR. We've worked with the DNR also on carp control. As a village, we've banned the use of phosphates. Uh, all of the things that are important to try to make sure that you take every action possible. And again, as we look at the, uh, the rain gardens and bioswales projects, quite surprising how many of the solutions can be influenced or, or implemented by the use of, of uh, a good best management practice within the community when it comes to stormwater runoff. So as we set out to design the project, um, we really focused in on three major goals, this trifecta of goals. Number one, and they're not in order, they're not priority, they're all absolutely interconnected, was to reduce the uh, the non-point source pollution that appears into our lake, that runs off into our lake. Uh, and the use of the word non-point source is important. Uh, what it does is it basically eliminates things that you can tackle directly, such as a leaking septic or a chemical spill. Non-point source pollution embraces things like runoff from the, from the roads, uh, pollutants from the atmosphere, pollutants from the hydrocarbons in the exhaust of the vehicles on 59 or Roberts or Kelsey Road. Those are things that are much harder to tackle at the point of pollution and yet contribute heavily into the runoff into the lake. We also set out to reduce the volume of water running into the lake. Uh, so on one hand, let's try and remove the pollutants, but also let's try and trap uh, and detain the water volume. Uh, and in doing so, allow it to infiltrate. And, and so these two, two points here are very, very closely related. And the third and enduring uh, part of the project was really to help influence the education of the community of the benefits of creating rain gardens, either as a community or on individual properties. Because I think every single one of us in Tower Lakes has within their yard space somewhere where water runs or water ponds, uh, that could be addressed and could improve the eventual runoff. And of course, all this water eventually makes it either into our aquifer or somebody's aquifer. So there's a downstream effect or it runs over the dam, goes into the fen and makes it into the Fox River. So, so overall, we feel that by educating the community on the power uh, of these best management practices and educating through outreach programs like this, communities around us, that we can help expand and extend that network of bioswales and rain gardens. Um, and that's been part of the, uh, the, the appeal of the project, also to the granting authorities, the people who've given us the money to, to help support these. What about the inspiration? Well, if you do anything in the area of community rain gardens and you Google it or you do any research at all, or you go to any presentations, as we did, uh, pretty soon you're gonna hear the name Burnsville. Burnsville town in Minnesota. And it's the classic study that anybody associated with rain gardens always points to. Uh, and it's published, I've got the publication if anybody wants to read a copy of it, it's easy, it's easy reading. And it was a pretty simple experiment. They took an area of the community in Burnsville and they divided it into two halves. 
uh, half was uh, half of the community or half of this particular area of Burnsville uh, implemented rain gardens instead of storm drains at all of the cuts in the pavement where there otherwise would have been storm drains. And then the corresponding other half of the street did not. They kept with the conventional uh, culverts and storm drain technology. And they looked and they measured the load of the runoff of the water as well as the pollutants that were making it uh, into the stormwater runoff. And the results were quite staggering. Uh, and you can see, uh, you don't have to be uh, scientific trained to see on the graph on the right hand side here, that they were looking at about a nine, 90% uh, reduction in the runoff. And of course it stands to reason if you can reduce the volume of water that's getting into the storm drain system and making it down to the lake in our case, you're inevitably reducing the pollutants. And then if you can implement uh, good best management practices of, of native plants for infiltration, you can reduce it still further. So they saw pretty staggering results and that became uh, the benchmark for, for our project and, and many projects like it. And you can see here, when they look at the annual percentage runoff, uh, the control group in the, in the, uh, the magenta color and, and then in the purpley color, the uh, construction group, the dramatic effect that it had reducing the volume and the pollutant level. So that became part of our, our inspiration and our design process. But none of this would have happened without the money. Uh, and the opportunity uh, every year, uh, Illinois EPA manage a federal program uh, called a 319H grant program. Uh, and different areas of, of geography within Illinois are focused. Uh, and back in 2016, the focus was in the northern suburbs. Uh, doesn't mean to say you can't apply anywhere in Illinois. Uh, you absolutely can. In fact, anywhere in the country. But they tend to have focused areas. And we had a window in 2016 uh, when they were targeting this neighborhood, uh, the northern suburbs. And this is an interesting program. And there's, there's literally millions of dollars made available every year by the federal uh, EPA administered through the state EPA. Uh, and the money is, is uh, sourced through fines that are levied on companies who are deemed to pollute the waterways of the Mississippi. And it seems very appropriate to me that they would then use that money and push it back into projects that are seen to be cleaning up the waters of the Mississippi. And, and I didn't know, but now I do, that Tower Lakes, our humble little community that feeds into Tower Lakes Fen and feeds into the Fox River, eventually finds its way into the Mississippi. So here we are, the headwater of the Mississippi. So by uh, putting together a grant application in 2016 with some help, we were able to secure a very generous uh, amount of money that helped get us uh, to a point where the program or the project became viable and feasible. Uh, and, and without that, we wouldn't have been able to start it off. We'd have been on a much smaller scale. So this is an overview of the project itself. Uh, we started with uh, forming a team that was designed to complete uh, what we knew already would be a four-year project turned into a five-year project. And it was a joint collaboration effort between the Homeowners Association, Tower Lakes Improvement Association, and the village, the municipality, the village of Tower Lakes. And the reason why that's important is the stormwater infrastructure is the responsibility of the village. And the grant application uh, uh, was managed by the, the village. But the land on which we were able to build the rain gardens and the lake itself are the property of the Homeowners Association, Tower Lakes Improvement Association. So without the collaboration of the two uh, entities, this would not have been possible. And we collaborate very closely on many of these environmental improvement projects. Uh, we set out to obtain the funding and we approached two sources of funding. Uh, one was the 319 grant I just mentioned, and the other was the very generous uh, opportunities afforded by Lake County Stormwater Management Commission, uh, which, for which we've taken full advantage as a community, and actually two Lake County grants were selected uh, to support this project. We had to select a, an environmental engineering a support partner for this project, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, I, and I don't want to put people off. Uh, you're going to see an engineered rain garden project, 
But nevertheless, you don't have to do that in your own property on a smaller scale. Uh, and we set out to design and build two major engineered rain gardens, which would allow us to capture high volumes of stormwater runoff from big areas uh, and allow that stormwater to, to infiltrate into the ground and for the plants, the native plants, to uh, remove the pollutants and the chemicals. We also set out as part of the project to restore uh, a wetland that uh, had been uh, turned into turf grass over the years. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And we had a constant battle with a muddy area of, of turf land that really uh, we, should, we, we should have recognized as wetland before and turned it back into what it uh, rightly, rightly is. Um, and then we set out to establish, and we have established, a very robust program of community education to support that third important outreach goal of the program. Uh, and that continues uh, at every opportunity, in, including this one. And thank you very much to uh, CFC for allowing it. So these are the locations. Let me get my little pointer. Um, firstly, a, a park area that's actually close to the village hall, which is here. Um, very visible to people who come into the community, uh, very easy to spot. Uh, and then secondly, on the lake side, what we also call, locally know as East Boat Landing, which is officially uh, name is Wagner Park. Uh, so these were the two areas that were selected and targeted. They're both on the east side of the village, which is the uh, older side of the village where the infrastructure is probably at its worst. Um, that's not to say we don't have plenty of other opportunities uh, for other such projects if we can secure the right funding. Because of the size and the scale of the project and the need to have a, a construction design and construction partner, um, we were uh, required to go out to a proper tender process, an RFP, uh, and we did uh, publish an RFP. Surprisingly, we, we had a, a number of bids and the range for the same project of bids was quite amazing. Uh, 57,000 at the low end and 400,000 at the high end. Uh, and yet everybody was bidding on the same project. And, and one of the cautions I would urge for any communities thinking about doing this is, is make sure that your specification is extremely uh, robust to avoid scope creeping in either direction. Um, the, uh, I think if we, uh, if we had our time again, we may have spent more time on the specification. But we formed a small review committee and shortlisted three. Those companies came in and made presentations to the community. And then in 2016, at the end of 2016, we selected NCAP uh, as our partner. And they've been our partner for five years through this project. And I would highly recommend them for projects of this scale. If we take a little bit of a look at the money, um, the total value of this project, and please don't be put off, this is a major engineered rain garden project in the community. Uh, this is, does not reflect what you could do on smaller scales. The scales can be anything from a couple of, a couple of hundred dollars to thousands of dollars. But we chose uh, a project that was worth about $260,000. And through the generous grant from the EPA, we were able to fund directly 160,000 of that from the EPA. We also received money uh, from Stormwater Management Commission of Lake County uh, to the tune of uh, $10,000 and $12,000. But of course, all of these grants come with a match requirement. In the case of the uh, EPA, it's a 60-40 match requirement. Uh, for Lake County, it's 50-50. Uh, so when you sign up for these grant programs, you also have to make sure that you have in, in your mind and in your project plan, how are you going to match them? Now, in both cases, volunteer hours count. And that's where we were able to use the tremendous volunteerism of the community to step up and make those matches. Because quite honestly, our community doesn't have the cash to, to put up even the match. Um, so we're very fortunate that we do have the army of volunteers. Um, so now into the action. So we got the RFP done. Uh, we started the program of education with open days and neighbor consultation. We also had to do the permitting. We established a regular sequence of newsletter articles. We put signage into the, the location so people could see it. And we started to build the groundswell of support that we would need to be successful. 
Um, permitting is not to be overlooked. And, and for phase one, which was the base park project, we needed both Lake County jurisdiction, a Lake County wetland development plan. We needed to apply to the uh, DNR to make sure that we didn't have any endangered species in the park area. And we also needed a village permit, all of which takes time. This is Bays Park before the project. On the left-hand side here, you can see as you come into the village, if anybody knows us, you drop straight down the hill from behind the, uh, the village office. And it's the first thing you see is, is the uh, Bays Park project. It's about an acre in size, um, but its catchment area was all the way up from Route 59, all the way round through the community here, uh, and down the first hillside. So the catchment area was quite large and also featured heavily the most trafficked piece of our, our village on 59. It was already partially a wetland um, and we were able to work with Lake County to make sure that we, uh, we have the right uh, delineations in place. It also contains a volleyball course and we had to make sure that whatever we did didn't damage that. And we were also very cognizant of the, uh, the mature uh, heritage trees that were in the park to make sure that we didn't cause any uh, collateral damage along the way. The first rain garden we did was an eight, almost 8,000 square feet. So it's really quite big. Um, we tied it into all of the storm drains to make sure that we captured every drop of, of runoff that we could. Uh, and it has a capacity of 12,000 cubic feet uh, which I realize probably doesn't mean very much, but it, it's kind of like the size of a swimming pool in terms of its, a big swimming pool in terms of its capacity. Most importantly, it was designed to have the ability to infiltrate a, 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 an equivalent of 16 inches of rainfall per hour. Now, anybody who studies rainfall knows you'd never get 16 inches of rainfall per hour, but because of the ratio of the catchment area to the collection point, it's very easy to get 16 inches per hour. In fact, it's only really about less than an inch per hour falling on the community generates 16 inches per hour at the rain garden. Uh, and that's the equivalent of a, a 25 year high rainfall event. Now, another thing that I learned along the way is that 25 year high rainfall events don't happen every 25 years. In fact, in the year that we did this park, we had three of them. So that was a, a bit of a, an aha moment. But you can see it's designed to handle an extremely high, heavy rainfall event, um, which recently hasn't been that rare. And it's a combination of, of engineered uh, and landscaped uh, and uh, topography uh, changes that allow for spillways to be created and burns and overflows. And you'll see some examples of that. We also worked with the two immediate neighbors and we tied it into their storm drains so that we could capture the runoff from their properties as well. And we tied it into the under, under layers of the, uh, the park to make sure that we had maximum infiltration. So this is the construction photos and you can see this is not for the faint hearted when it comes around to uh, the engineering portion. But again, I do want to stress that you don't need to do this if you're doing our rain gardens on a smaller scale and you're going to see some other examples where there's nothing like this but this is why it couldn't be two of a, two of the guys in tower lakes with shovels to create something like this we needed an engineering partner and you can see here the excavation tying it into neighborhoods neighbors storm drains also we were very lucky that we uh, we found uh, a sand layer in the bottom of the uh, of the excavation and we were able to tie into the local sand layer uh, and then a gravel bed and the engineering construction with engineered soils going in and then eventually planting. And we'll see some more of that in just a moment. So on July the 4th of 2017, we opened our first rain garden and you can see here the plugs and the community got together for a, a, a formal opening on a beautiful sunny day. But if any rem anybody remembers 2017, it didn't stay that way for very long. We had quite a bit of rain. Um, for the gardeners on the call, here are the plants that we chose uh, as our selection and the community uh, gardeners got together to choose these. Um, please never think that a rain garden is just grasses. These are all beautiful flowering plants that have been designed uh, to flower at different times of the year to turn into a very robust uh, habitat for pollinators. 
um, and they uh, they make for a very beautiful uh, and long lived uh, visual effect. Uh, I've highlighted one plant here, the obedient plant. Uh, of the 3000 plugs, we did choose obedient plant in one area and uh, it absolutely took over. Uh, <laughs> and we've been kind of challenged with that ever since to make sure that it doesn't overrun the garden and we keep it in balance. So there's always lessons to be learned and, and we have certainly learned that lesson that uh, obedient plant with sun and wet feet, oof, off it goes. Uh, as I say, I'm not a gardener, but I learned that one the hard way. So very quickly though, in 2017, we also had some major rainfalls. We had uh, two 25 year highs, a 50 year high and a 100 year high, all in the space of about six weeks. And they completely filled and overwhelmed the garden. And you can see in the center view here, this is the spillway, which is, it's actually designed to overflow in a controlled manner. And it did, it overflowed. Uh, you can see the picture in the top right there of it being completely flooded. And yet within just a couple of hours, it's, it's infiltrated. So all of this water you see here is water that did not get into the storm drain system. And then although the, the plants weren't mature enough to do any, any good at this point, um, obviously you get the concept. And we were very pleased even at the beginning with how well the engineering portion, the detention portion worked. But then within even a year, the plants started to thrive. Um, so these images were all taken in our garden uh, in 2018. So just one year later, and already you're seeing some very, very beautiful uh, flowering plants coming through and a very uh, active pollination area with uh, bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, regular visitors into the park. And, and it truly looks beautiful uh, throughout the summer. Uh, it really does. So while this was maturing, we entered into phase two and phase three. And one of the reasons why we did it in phases was to make sure that we could keep up with the matching funds piece of this through the volunteers. Uh, so we kept logs of the hours and rigorous uh, records of everything that we did. But phases two and three happened at the same time and in the same location down by the lake. And because it's a lakeside location, it fell under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers. Again, a very, very visible area. If anybody knows our community, they know that we have islands where there's events and, and uh, activities during the summer. This is really the focus, the heart of the villages in this area. So we wanted something as a showcase that people would see uh, every day during the summer. But again, we also needed to pick an area with a big catchment area. And you can see here, the catchment area is, is, is over an acre of, of land and we tied it into all of the road storm drains from here, from here, from here, and uh, from the north. So all of the area that, of the runoff was captured and, and directed into the rain garden. Uh, there was also an area of wetland you can see here, which was restored and you'll see some pictures of that in just a moment. We were very lucky to get a second grant. Uh, we worked with the Army Corps, uh, second grant from Lake County, I should say. We worked with the Army Corps uh, to get permitting, uh, which is a process which was new to, to me at least and to, to our community. And we were able to break ground on this project in the spring of 2019. And we can finish the construction portion uh, a couple of months later. And again, we chose July the 4th, which is a huge weekend in, in our community uh, as the grand opening. This is a slightly smaller rain garden. It's about 5,000 square feet, but again, designed to capture and infiltrate 16 inches of rainfall per hour. Again, equivalent to a 25 year high rainfall event. So very similar design. Um, and outside of the rain garden scope, but in combination with the village and the engineers, we were also able to tie it into a, a, a restoration project of the parking area close to the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the park and some replacement storm drains so that we were able to make sure that we had great and even bigger capture of the stormwater uh, runoff and directing it all straight into the rain garden. So this was the construction of phase two, slightly smaller project uh, using more bioswale. Uh, these are gullies that are designed to, to move the water and then can be planted in as well, uh, tying into the storm drains uh, with an excavation uh, project, as you can see here. 
Moving on to the planting, a uh, slightly smaller project, but still needing a lot of plugs. Uh, and one of the biggest expenses in the project is actually the plugs themselves. Uh, and then you can see the, uh, the, the berming and the landscaping that goes on around it. This is the wetland. Um, it was originally a very muddy turf grass area, but it's a highly trafficked, foot trafficked area with a footpath running across the bottom here to the islands. Uh, which was favorite with the kids but they would all get covered in mud uh, so it was a, it was a good project to to help the community but also uh, as part of the uh, the relationship with lake county it was part of our commitment was to restore it as a wetland uh, so it was herbicide treated and then it was uh, seeded heavily uh, and left to to grow on its own and we also seeded the berms around the rain garden very heavily in this case we had a bigger variety of plants that were selected, plugs, so more species uh, of plants. And you'll notice this time the complete absence of any obedience plant. I'd like to think we learned our lesson. Uh, and again, we chose July the 4th for the grand opening. Uh, you can see uh, Kathleen Leitner, past president of, of the uh, village here, Dave Parrow, current president of the village, Steve Bagoon, uh, president of the Homeowners Association. And this gentleman here is, is the son of the, uh, the person whose the park was originally named for, Cyril Wagner. This is his son who flew in from California the first part of the opening, which was kind of nice. Uh, and the picture on the bottom left here just illustrates how we were able to tie into the storm drains. The pipes disappeared now, but you can see we've even tied into the, the, uh, the culvert system. For the wetland, we chose a, a two-stage process, initially just to stabilize everything, there was a, a fast growing seed mix applied that was uh, oats and rye and grass. Um, but then we applied uh, a very broad seed mix. And if anybody wants these lists, I'll be happy to, to provide them to them. A very broad seed mix, um, some of which took, some didn't. Uh, and we've been supplementing the seeds along the way to, to uh, continue to enhance the wetland. That's quite a slow process, to be honest. I've highlighted here one of the seeds that was applied though, the black eyed Susan, and you can see just a few of them growing in the, uh, in the wetland there. But wow, last summer, by the time we got to May, ooh, did those black eyed Susans love it. Uh, and we had a tremendous show right at the beginning of the year. And the rain garden itself, you can see here is growing, but nothing's bloomed yet in the rain garden. This was taken uh, late May, early June. It's still too early for the rain garden in its first season to, to even start to bloom. And yet the black eyed Susans all around it were, were absolutely in bloom. And that started to bring in the pollinators and got that initial interest in the community. Everybody loved to see it, it was very visual. But later in the summer, we did get the, uh, the native plants growing and you can see here combinations of mallows and, uh, and coneflowers. And of course my favorite right in the middle there with the milkweed and the cardinals, which we we're pretty passionate about it in, in Tower Lakes. So if I want to summarize the project uh, in terms of the rain gardens, that we, we did two engineered rain gardens, a combination of which is about 13,000 square feet uh, and a 17,000 square foot wetland restoration. That gave us a detention capacity uh, of 16 inches per hour. In total, we planted over 5,000 plugs and have actually had to replace a few along the way. A total of 23 different species of native wetlands and 49 species that went into the, uh, uh, into the wetland itself. The original project was scoped at $266,000. It came in slightly lower than that, largely because of an increase in volunteerism uh, over what we had uh, uh, originally thought was, would even be possible. Um, it came in about $235,000, and that includes two years of professional maintenance on each of the rain gardens. And I think that's really important because in those early stages, when you've made this kind of investment, um, it really needs that kind of TLC for at least the first couple of years before it becomes mature enough to go to a more of a, a normal maintenance uh, approach. In total, uh, we received funding of about $144,000, $150,000, and the match value from the community was $90,000, of which 100% came from volunteerism. The value of the community hours, we, we totaled over 1,000 man hours, 
uh, of volunteerism. Actually, by the time we finished the project, it was closer to 1,100 man hours of volunteerism. So the community got these three wonderful uh, best management practices effectively free of charge, free of charge through the volunteerism. As we look to the, ex the ongoing aspect of the community, we shift from the original uh, triple aim to the education portion. Uh, and when we started this project, in terms of, of homeowners gardens that had been certified by either CFC uh, through, the, uh, through the Habitat Corridor Programme or by BACT through the, the uh, home uh, garden uh, projects, uh, it was just two. And by the time we'd finished, four years later, we were over 25 and it still grows today. And we continue to push the outreach portion of this uh, uh, project to make sure that all of the homeowners who have the opportunity recognize the potential for planting very modest and, and inexpensive gardens, rain gardens or, or bioswales within their own community. And wherever we've got shoreline projects or uh, water ingress projects that we do as a community, we're constantly thinking about uh, how can we uh, plant uh, native plants and, and infiltrate the pollutants rather than have them run straight into the, uh, the lake. Uh, this map is taken straight from the uh, Illinois website and the references here for CFC and, and BACT uh, and Peggy mentioned also the, uh, the habitat. Uh, so there's organizations that will come out and give you advice. These two are probably the, the finest, uh, but they will also certify your projects as well um, so that you can uh, show and demonstrate to other members of the community the, the value of these projects, these best management practices. Here's a couple of examples of uh, neighbors gardens. Uh, and you can see they range in size and scale, uh, but all feature heavily uh, flowering plants and wetland plants and native plants. Um, they're either on the side of the road or in some in backyards. They're all over the place now. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to see uh, the, the interest that's developed within the, in the community on this. A couple more pictures. Uh, this one's relatively recent on the top right here. This just went in last year. I'm sure it'll look beautiful this year. Um, and even down by the lake and, and uh, into people's yards all around the, the community. So in terms of uh, what did it take to succeed, and in some ways, of course, the recommendations. For a project of this scale, a community project, it's absolutely critical that you have uh, extremely good partnerships with uh, external uh, companies to do this through the environmental engineering. Um, you need to engage the community very early. I believe that's critical to the success, especially of the education program. Um, we were very fortunate to already have good relationships um, and have continued to develop even stronger relationships with the EPA, with Lake County Stormwater Management, with the Army Corps, with the Department of Natural Resources and other uh, local groups such as the Nine Lakes uh, Partnership, uh, CMAP, uh, helped us with shoreline uh, advice and shoreline surveying uh, and so on. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of communication with the residents. Newsletters, town hall meetings, every opportunity, meeting with the neighbours one on one who are going to be next to the rain garden, explaining that they're not just going to get some overgrown grassland, showing them pictures, getting that buy in from the community really is a critical success factor. And then the last thing I would say is, is, is just to hang on for the ride. It's, these are not fast projects. Even a small project in the backyard still takes about three years to truly mature to its full potential. You, know, you, can, you can clear an area and plant that, that gets wet and plant some native plants in it, and it'll look good in the first year, it'll look better in the second year, but it really comes into its own in the third year. Uh, and keep the faith through that period and set those expectations as well with the community. Peggy did mention that this projects have been recognized. Uh, we were very uh, fortunate and grateful to be recognized for the Barrington Area Conserva uh, Council of Governors Donald Klein Award in 2019. And also the best management practice was recognized by Lake County with a stewardship award. Uh, and we're hopeful that the, uh, the recognition may continue. But that of course helps Get, get future grants and future uh, information out there. So 
Going forward, uh, next steps, we continue to promote the best management practice in the community and the communities around us through opportunities like this. Um, we identify grant opportunities wherever possible. We've got certainly other ideas and other locations where we think we could uh, extend and build further rain gardens and bioswale initiatives. Um, we've got some other ongoing related projects we've just complete, completed this year or last year, I should say, through a very generous uh, grant from Lake County Stormwater Management Commission again, uh, a complete hydro hydraulic and hydrologic study looking at the impact of the lake levels, which of course have been high over the last few years, on the groundwater levels and the runoffs of some areas of the community, because we've seen some pretty significant changes uh, over the last few years in the way that runoffs happen and the impact of high levels of lake water having on high levels of groundwater uh, around the community. Uh, and who knows where, I mean, the, the, the community is extremely active in this area uh, and opportunities are popping up all the time to, uh, to look for other uh, BMPs. Um, in fact, there's no doubt in my mind that there's certainly more opportunities than there will ever be time and resources and, and that, that's going to keep us going for a long time. Uh, I really want to stress the thank yous um, this would not be possible without the generous support of the EPA and the incredible financial and advice support from Lake County Stormwater Management. They've been absolutely brilliant to work with. To both the Village Board and to the Homeowners Association TLIA boards uh, for for allowing this project and for supporting these projects all the way through and having the vision to see that the end justifies the, the journey. Um, and to all the other local organizations, uh, including CFC, uh, Nine Lakes, uh, Tower Lakes uh, uh, Drain Partnership, and many, many others. And with that, and before my voice gives out, I will uh, pause and say thank you again to Barrington uh, Area Library and to Citizens for Conservation for giving Tower Lakes the opportunity to present this to you. And uh, with that, if there's any questions, Sam, I will be happy to take them. We did have a couple of questions come in. I might have you, um, if you wouldn't mind ending the screen share and then I will add myself and I'm actually um, Peggy, just to give fair warning, I'm going to spotlight you for just a moment because I think you may be best placed to answer this first question. Um, so during your introduction, Peggy, you mentioned that CFC will come out and do a site visit for members. Um, does one need to be a Barrington area resident to be a member? And how far, how far are you willing to travel to, to offer a site visit? No, no, you do not need to be a, a Barrington area uh, person to be a member of CFC. We have memberships uh, internationally, actually, uh, but but all, all over the area. Um, but in terms of the site visits, it's uh, the, pretty much the northwest, this corner of northwest suburbs. Um, we we were, we've had visits in Lake Zurich and and even Arlington Heights and uh, up you know and around the area. But I might point out that the areas that CFC doesn't cover for site visits, there are other organizations in the Chicago area who do. And I'll give a plug for the Chicago Living Corridors Alliance, which is a group that has, uh, is kind of an umbrella group pulling together all of these other groups like CFC who do site visits, trying to both uh, expand and then, and then map all of the private property in the Chicago area that has improved habitat. So um, chicagolivingcorridors.org, you can find more information if you're out, you know, if you're, for example, if you are in Evanston or uh, Naperville or, you know, someplace that we don't, we don't go, there are groups that do. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I will remove your spotlight. It looks like I just want to add, though, I, I, I wrote the comment in there when Andy was talking about the obedient plant taking over. We have renamed it disobedient plant for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to plant it unless you have a big area. You just want it to, to, to run rampant in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I am going to try and go through these sort of in order from the general to the specific, but but they are still coming in. So I may we may jump around a little bit. 
Um, so going back to the very beginning, what motivated you and the people of Tower Lakes who were involved to explore the possibility of using rain gardens as a solution to your problem? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm going to give credit actually to Kathleen Leitner from CFC, who was then president, along with Steve Bagoon, uh, for attending uh, other presentations where projects of this type, rain gardens, bioswales, best management practices, had been used as part of a, an overall program to improve water quality and, and, and uh, lake health. Um, our lake uh, committee were, was very committed on, on a very expensive journey to remove the sediment from the lake. And yet we still had weed and algae problems. We still have the ongoing runoff of sediments and pollutants. Uh, so it really became, it really grew out of that. Uh, so while we're dealing with the acute problem of eutrophication, how do we also deal with the long-term solution uh, of improving the, the water quality? Uh, and that's what generated the project. Thank you. Um, any success stories of changing residents' minds about the value of a rain garden? People who were initially skeptical or did not want a rain garden and came around? Well, I'll start with me. Because <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest. I. I I was skeptical uh, and I certainly was one of those people who if you, if you had asked me five years ago what is a rain garden I would have probably pointed to a, a, a bunch of grass a bunch of tall grass um, uh, yeah I mean I think really th there's been huge success uh, and we've installed some signage at, at, at the rain gardens to say what it is what people are looking at uh, I think the, the, the fact that we've gone from just two people in the community with rain gardens, two people in the know, both of whom are on this call, uh, to now 25 and, and more. Uh, we've got people within our community uh, who are actually uh, certified to do the certifications and give the advice. Uh, so I think there's been a number of instances that we can point to where, where people who were perhaps either lack the knowledge or lack the belief that these projects were, were valuable, uh, have changed their mind, but, but probably nobody more so than myself. Okay. There's one that kind of, um, and I think you may have kind of answered this in your previous answer, but um, someone is asking the number one way to encourage property owners to add native plants and handle their stormwater on a smaller scale. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think demonstration. You, you've got to show people what it looks like. Uh, you, you've got to explain the uh, the mechanics of, of the I, concepts like uh, non-point source pollution. It's, it's not in, intuitive where the problems come from. Um, and, and then really tie it back to every little piece helps. A, a, a small 10 by 5 rain garden in somebody's community, in somebody's property, that happens to be where their water ponds before it runs down to the storm drain, is as good if we have enough of them as a big project like this. You know, if, if everybody captured the water at the point of its of its landing on their land and it detained it, infiltrated it, we wouldn't need storm drains. Um, and of course, we've got a, a, a community that quite likes adding extensions onto houses and non-permeable surfaces, which which adds to the problem of the infrastructure and the runoff. And the runoff just goes unless we put it through some kind of biofiltration, the runoff is going to go straight into the lake. It's a straight shot down a pipe. So, so I think the, that resonated with, with people in the community and, and uh, you know, it, 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 but it's not a fast journey. Uh, step by step, one neighbor does it, the next neighbor sees it, we talk to each other, the next one and the next one. Um, do you have before and after numbers? on stormwater reduction from the project? No, we, we do not. We don't have the technology to measure it. Uh, and to put that technology in place was extremely exp would be extremely expensive. That's why I, I was quite happy to point to references such as, as Burnsville, and there's many of them out there. Um, there are some states that are extremely active in this. Oregon, uh, is very, very leading edge, uh, and the state funds residents to, to do these, these practices. Uh, so there's plenty of literature out there, but for us to generate our own data was out of reach. 
understandable. Um, I will give a quick shout out to Baycog for the area overall. They do so, so much work on yep. stormwater and, you know, well management, that sort of a thing. So I would encourage anyone who's curious to learn more to visit their site. It's just Baycog, B-A-C-O-G dot org. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sam, actually. And we do participate in that as far as the well water and the, and the, the, the lake quality water. We also um, participate in the uh, volunteer lake management program, uh, VLMP. Uh, and though that data, chemical data is recorded on the, that's on a nationwide basis, Tower Lakes participates in that. Yeah, I know. They do a lot of citizen sciences projects too, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of fun. Um, what, uh, I'm not sure about the order, what's, what's most logical on these. So I'm just gonna go through them in order. Um, what landscaping companies bid on the projects? Are you comfortable speaking about that? Uh, actually, I, I'm not sure I've got the permission to say that. So I'll, I'll leave it at just the end cap uh, was the successful bidder. Okay. If you, if you don't mind. Yeah. No. If, if somebody wants to contact me one-on-one, -on -one, I, I can, I can help them with that. Okay. Um, then do I have permission to put your email address in yes. the chat? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Question about sump pumps. Do sump pumps exit into the rain gardens or is it just downspout water? Uh, so the downspout water from the two neighbors exits into the rain garden. Uh, Tower Lakes uh, doesn't allow sump pumps to exit um, into, into open spaces uh, other than uh, where they're from rain garden runoff sump, uh, sorry, from stormwater runoff sump pumps. Uh, so we would capture that if it ran over the ground. Uh, but as far as uh, internal sumps from uh, infiltrates such as uh, you know, washing machines or something, that has to go into the septic. Okay. Um, we have someone who wanted to know where you acquired the plant plugs. Uh, they, uh, so NCAP, our partner, uh, acquired the, the plant plugs and I do know where they came from, uh, and I'm spacing on the name of the nursery. It's a local nursery. I think it was up in Richmond, Richmond area. Is that Midwest ground covers? Yes, that, that rings a bell. That may, be, that may well be it. it, it uh, again, uh, we didn't acquire them. It was part of the, uh, the partnership that we did, uh, included that. Okay, great, thank you. It's a lot, you, th you think planting 5,000 plugs without the professionals is backbreaking work. Yes. I can imagine. Um, and I will also give a, a plug because I'm sure Peggy is chomping at the bit to do it for the CFC plant sale that is coming up. I glanced at a couple before I decided I probably shouldn't be on another website eating up bandwidth while I was recording this. And a number of the plants that you used are available through CFC's plant sale. So thank you. Um, we have a couple people who just wanted to say, um, point out that uh, a few people who have rain gardens of their own and that they love them. Um, it doesn't take a lot of upkeep, no. so always nice. Um, and someone else who talks about how the community was so involved in the project and all the hours they contributed, um, which I agree with. I um, another. Um, the library has partnered with the Barrington Area Development Council to create um, the Barrington Area Volunteer Connection. Um, and when you were putting those numbers up, that's part of what our goal is, is for people to be able to see how valuable their time is to the nonprofits in the community. Um, so if anybody here is interested in doing more volunteering, the website to start at is thebavc.org. Um, and that is, you know, op opportunities that are specific to our area and benefit our local nonprofits. Yeah. Um, and I know, uh, go ahead. I, I would add, actually, if you, if, you, if you are contemplating a project like this, it, there's, there's value assigned to volunteer hours um, by the EPA, for instance, and also by Lake County. Uh, and it's surprising. It, it's not minimum wage. Uh, when it comes around to, to quantifying the value. Uh, and that was an important consideration for our community because otherwise we'd have been saddled with a big financial bill, a you know, big cash bill that we just didn't have the, the cash to do. 
Uh, and I think uh, understanding what the, how you're going to make the match and doing the math on that and then recording every single hour of rigorously of volunteerism and getting the sign-in sheets done, that was, that was probably one of the key success factors as well uh, of this. So when I said at the very top that um, part of my role as community engagement librarian is working for the benefit of nonprofits, one of the things that I do is help nonprofits learn about grants, how to write grants, things of that sort. And yes, can confirm um, being able to quantify those things is important. And um, I think we have a couple people who are nonprofit managers on the call who are using the VAVC. And it does all of that recording of hours. Volunteers can check in and out on an app. I know I'm putting on a commercial right now. Um, and, um, and it will keep it all for you and put the value on it for you. So I wish I'd known that. Yeah, well, it's new. We rolled out in January of this year. So yeah, but um, we have someone who's asking, some people in the area have now become certified you mentioned what are the certifications that you're referring to? Yeah, maybe maybe Peggy's best equipped to to answer that as to how the people who uh, go out from uh, CFC to to the community to help with the education and then the certification. Yes, that that can be part of the uh, the habitat corridors process, and the same thing is true with conservation at home. Is uh, the certification happens after the. Uh, there's a there's a checklist of a number of kinds of uh, factors that need to be involved. Uh, it's 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 the native plants is a big part of it, but it's also uh, what you're doing for pollinators. As Andy uh, commented, some of the plants they planted were were definitely pollinator attractors or birds. <clears throat> But also some of the uh, the uh, good yard practices, so the very kinds of things that Andy's project was trying to prevent, like uh, the nitrogen from fertilizer getting into the water, or um, well, having having um, not um, not using uh, insecticides. I mean, there's an, you know a number of things in addition to the planting that makes for good habitat. So those are all the kind of characteristics that are included in the in uh, in allowing the, the the certification. You can have a site visit without getting to the point of certification if you just want to have help getting started, for example. Uh, but I also wanted to mention now that I have a microphone. <laughs> uh, when you're talking about company organizations that help do this, last year we had a speaker whose name is Marcus de la Fleur, who uh, is in the business of helping homeowners work with stormwater management. And, and so doing sort of on a mini scale, some of what Andy was talking about on a big scale, uh, but he also does the measurement of how much square footage of a roof it, it, it takes to, to, you know, well, what, what size uh, rain garden you need to accommodate the water that's a runoff from your roof or from your sump pump or whatever. And, and to the point, the question about sump pumps, we do have uh, uh, Meredith Tucker, who, who used to be in charge of habitat corridors, uh, put a rain garden in her yard and she actually has her sump pump drain go directly right in, into the rain garden, in addition to, you know, the, the, uh, the downspouts and whatnot. So there's lots of ways to deal with that. But but I, I would recommend if somebody wanted to, to get get in touch with Marcus de la Fleur. Um, you know, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of his company, but uh, maybe if you just uh, Google his name, you'd find out uh, who, who could who can help with the small scale rain garden. Okay. Um, part of it. And if we can chat and um, if you can get me that information, I can add it to the, the resources that we list on the YouTube. Um, sure. I will also, um, I'm doing a program with Barrington Area Conservation Trust in April on April 8th. Um, that is uses an environmental re restoration specialist, David Eubanks, who's done project for projects for Cook County, um, Forest Preserve, City of Chicago, Lincoln Park Conservancy, a few of those. So that might be a good resource. I, I should mention that Alicia Tim is on, is on this uh, site right now, and, and she is now the uh, head of the Habitat Quarters program for, for Citizens for Conservation. So you'll, you'll, her name will come up too. <laughs> okay. She's probably the one that will con contact you if you if you inquire about having a site visit. Alicia just posted her details onto the chat as well. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. 
Um, and I think uh, we do have someone who is asking that they saying they would like to become certified. And I think you kind of covered that in your talk, but yeah, yeah, if they want to. Okay. And we'll add that information. Yeah. So, so the CFC uh, web, website or BACT website uh, conservation at home certification program. So the, uh, the, the habitat corridors or the, uh, the conservation at home program, those are the two that uh, are prevalent in our community. But as Peggy mentions, there's, there's others as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any further questions come up in chat. So I think we are just about finished. Um, I am going to throw, I'm going to put the links that we talked about at the beginning um, in the chat again. So uh, that will include the Citizens for Conservation website, the general website, as well as the specific link to the plant sale. Um, and I will say, um, I think I've five, six years ago now, this was the year my youngest kid graduated. Um, I bought a bunch of natives and the resources that CFC offers about specific plants, their needs, everything is one of the best that I've found. So I recommend, recommend that very highly. Um, and then if anyone is interested in joining either of the candidate forums later today, um, you can register for that and I will send the Zoom links for those meetings. Um, a couple of important things coming up for our area. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, thank, thanks to everyone for being here with us. We really appreciate it. Um, Andy, you're getting some very specific thanks from people. So we appreciate it. We appreciate your time. And I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Um, this has been a great experience for me. So thank you well, thank very you. much. All right. Yes, thank you, Andy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.